Hello and welcome to our final lesson in Key Question 3, The Coming of War for Depression War and Recovery, 1930-1951. to We're going to look at various different things today, including things like radar, conscription, reserved occupation, barrage balloons, air raid shelters, all these kinds of things. And you're going to be able to answer the question, how did Britain prepare for war and which was the most effective method? At the end, we're going to create some top trump cards of all these methods just to bring our knowledge together and consolidate it so we are definitely sure that we understand. So, first things first. If we were in class, I'd get you to think pay share, but obviously if you are watching this video, it means that we are at home. Um, and so what I would like you to do is create a mind map on a double page with how did Britain prepare for war in the middle. And I want you to think about on your own how you think Britain prepared for war. What did it do to prepare for the Second World War? Before we go into anything, what do you think it did? So I'm going to give you two minutes. Um, I suggest you pause the video and get on with it so that I can move on. Okay, so hopefully you've done that now when you've got some ideas down yourself. Now, I want you to look at these pictures now and add to your mind map. What do you think you can add from looking at these pictures? So we've got things like um, the, air, the Air Forces, Anderson shelters, air raid wardens, radar, um, anti-aircraft guns, barrage balloons, Morrison shelters, all these kinds of things, okay? All these are kinds of things that, that, how Britain, uh, that relate to how Britain prepared for war. So if you could add some of these now to your mind map, again, two minutes, I suggest you pause the video. So hopefully you've done that now. So we're going to look at these things in a little bit more depth. Now, before the outbreak of war, the government had put plans in place in recognition that we would probably end up going to war against Germany. It started a programme to build new warships. It spent money informing people about rationing and blackouts and gas masks, advertising, putting leaflets through doors. Um, it ensured that overseas supplies continued. Met with trade unions, which was really important, to make sure that there would be no strikes and no problems if there was a war. Um, and that wartime regulations were, were discussed just to make sure that the, the economy would keep taking over um, and that things things and supplies would, would always be there. Um, but Britain wasn't totally prepared in 1938, in 1939, um, to fight a massive, massive war. It would take time to match the sheer size and effectiveness of the German forces. We did have a good Royal Navy that was prepared, but the RAF, although they were well trained with good aircrafts like the Hurricane and the Spitfire, the RAF bombers were not as modern. Um, the army was quite small, it didn't have much equipment, and by appeasing Hitler, we had gained a bit more time. We had about another 12 months. And then in September, when we actually did declare war, we had six months of what we call the phony war, where nothing really happened. So that did give a bit Britain a little bit more time to prepare for war. But all in all, it wasn't totally ready by the time 1939 came around. OK, so what was conscription? So add conscription to your mind map for me now, please. Um... So even though the, uh, the RAF was well trained and equipped, it was really small, the army was also too small, therefore the government introduced conscription. Now conscription means making men go into the army, conscripted into the armed forces, okay? Um, and by the end of 1939, more than 1.5 million men had been conscripted into the armed forces. 1.1 million went to the British army and the rest of them were all split between the, the Royal Navy and the RAF. Lots and lots of men conscripted to go to war. In the First World War, they hadn't conscripted until quite late on. Um, and so they decided that doing the early was the best option here to make sure that they were completely prepared. OK, we also had reserved occupations. Really vital to keep work workers in certain occupations free to continue their roles, um, especially if they would help the war effort. Um, so there was a schedule of reserved occupations created. Um, there was about five million men in a vast range of jobs. You've got engineers, rail workers, dock workers, miners, farmers, agricultural workers, school teachers and doctors. Um, they actually conscripted some to go and work in on the farms, work on the docks, work as miners. This picture here is of the Bevan boys, and you know, the coal miners that were conscripted. Now, they call them the Bevan boys because of a man called Ernest Bevan. He was the Minister for Labour and National Service, and it was he was responsible for the schedule of reserved occupations. He was responsible for the scheme. Um, and so these boys were called the Bevan boys. And they were coal, coal, coal miners that were conscripted to go and, and mine to make sure that we had enough for the war, okay? School teachers and doctors as well, also in the reserved occupations, okay? So how did we try and protect? How did the government try and protect the British people? Well, propaganda was one of them, lots of posters, um, and a lot of it relating to basically air raid shelters, air raids, how to deal with air raids, how to spot British airships, um, and trying to keep people calm during an air raid. 
Okay. Now, what I want you to do to have a look at how air raids were dealt with and pop air raid onto your spider diagram is I want you to watch this YouTube video here um, about air raids. And I want you to then go and watch this YouTube video, which it shows a scene from an air raid in Goodnight Mr. Tom. Now, I want you to go to one hour and two, um, one hour, two minutes and 36 seconds. And I want you to watch it until one hour 11. And that should give you a good idea of what a life was like in the air raid shelters. OK, if you could then um, just make some notes around air raid shelters on your, on your spider diagram. So I'm going to suggest that you pause the video and do that now for me. OK. So we also have blackouts. Everyone covering their windows before sunset with heavy blackout curtains, cardboard or paint to prevent any glimmer of light from escaping and aiding the enemy aircraft. They'd also light fires on top of mountains. So, for instance, um, Penavan, there was lights on Penavan to, to direct people away from the cities, Bristol, from Cardiff, um, from Swansea. They're in North Wales, there's a mountain called Paris Mountain um, and Rose Mountain, which is near Wrexham. They used to light fires on the top of that to direct people away from the, the bombers away from Liverpool. OK, um, street lights were turned off and dim. Traffic lights and vehicle headlights were fitted with slotted covers to deflect the beam downward. Lots of people actually injured or died in road accidents because there was no light in. So um, white stripes are painted on the roads and on lamp lampposts. Um, men were even advised to leave their shirt tails hanging out to be seen by cars. OK, so very, very dangerous time actually driving out and about during a blackout. So the role of the air raid warden is really important. OK, um, so air raid precaution wardens patrolled the streets. They warned people to turn out the lights. OK. Um, to make sure the blackouts were being adhered to. They were also expected to advise householders and coordinate emergency services and around half a million volunteered to join the ARP. Now, if you look on that doc, um, Good Night Mr Tom um, clip again that you've just seen, you, you could pull some points out there about the role of the air aid warden and what, what they actually did. Okay, um, So they were very, very important. Um, by 1938, 200,000 people had joined the service. Um, when the Czechoslovakia crisis happened, 500,000 had joined, okay? Um, they would work from home or a shop or office. They would register all the people that were in their sector, so in their area. They'd enforce the blackout. They'd sound sirens during attack. Um, they'd help people to their communal shelters, check on people who had their own shelter, carry out first aid, put out small fires, and coordinate other emergency services once the bombing raid was over. So they did a lot of jobs here, Okay. Most of them are volunteers and unpaid. Um, some were full-time and did receive a wage. Um, they didn't have a uniform, but they were given a steel helmet, a pair of Wellington boots and an armband as a means of making them identifiable. OK, so that was the role of an air raid warden. So how did they protect themselves? So if I play this for you. So when the Luftwaffe approached, local air raid wardens arranged for standing with the sirens. And when people heard this, they were expected to immediately take cover before the raid actually started. They would play another siren then to announce that it was safe to leave the air raid shelter. Okay, so that's the sound of the air raid shelter. Okay. So. Why were the air raid shelters necessary? Well, as soon as war was declared, every family with a garden received a shelter called an Anderson shelter. They were damp, they were uncomfortable, they were often overcrowded. Um, you could also have an indoor shelter called a Morrison shelter. Some preferred this because it was indoors. But again, which one was safer? You, you can sort of work that one out for yourself. A lot of schools had bomb shelters. Um, and the underground, the London underground was used as a shelter as well. OK. So just a picture there. Um, of someone using a part of their shelter, okay, and trying to build their Anderson shelters. So radar, radar is really important now. So your title on your mind map now needs to be radar. Um, radar, which is essentially seeing with radio waves um, from dozens of uses in the war. It was used to aim searchlights and to aim anti-aircraft guns. It's put on ships, it used to navigate the, through the fog, locate enemy ships and aircraft and to direct gunfire. It was put into aeroplanes where it might be used to locate hostile and aircraft or ships or navigate the aircraft to find bombing targets. It did not stop the German bombers getting through, but it did help the outnumbered RAF plan their attacks a little bit more effectively. Okay. Um, it, all, it made it possible to track them as well, and it, it concentrated the defence where it was needed. Okay, so that's it, that. Get some notes down about that on your mind map. The barrage blooms. 
Basically, um, they'd first been used during the First World War. They had a large balloon fitted with gas that was lighter than air and were attached to a steel cable. They were designed to float in the air at altitudes that would deny low-level airspace to attack an enemy aircraft, thus forcing the aircraft to fly at higher altitudes, which could make bombing less accurate. It's basically forcing the German planes to fly higher, um, blocking the airway so that they couldn't actually see what they were doing when they were bombing. And it really affected how accurate the German bombers could actually be. Um, there was 450 barrage balloons built to protect London. Um, when the war broke out in September 1939, not only would London need this type of defence, but other it, other areas, other cities did as well. Um, by 1940, there was 2,368 barrage balloons flying over the major strategic sites in Britain. They were actually really invaluable, the barrage balloons, okay? So I think, take what I've said by there um, and put it on the screen and get some notes down. Anti-aircraft guns, capable of rapid, high-rate fire and could fire at high angles. Um, the Bofors 40mm anti-aircraft gun had been developed by a Swedish manufacturer in the 30s and the British government had acquired a licence to build these guns and put them into service. They actually could fire at around 120 rounds a minute and fire around a two pound shell to a height of two miles above the ground. So they basically would attack in darkness um, and they'd take out the German bombers in the sky. And it was just a, a method of trying to protect British citizens. OK, so I want you using um, the, the information at the end of this PowerPoint. Now, at the end of this PowerPoint here, there are some extra bits of information for you. OK, so I want you to this PowerPoint is attached to the video. I want you to go to that and I want you to use all the slides, use all the information you've heard today. And I want you to create some top trump cards, okay? I want one for air raid wardens, air raid shelters, radar, barrage blues, and anti-aircraft guns and conscription, okay? Every trump card needs to have the name of the topic, a picture, the date it was introduced, um, who it affected, how sophisticated the system was in your opinion, overall rating of how thorough Britain are prepared for war and all the scores are out of 10, okay? So again, I'm going to suggest that you pause the video and get going with that. It's probably going to take you a while. Okay? Now, just to end out and bring it all together, I want you to use these slides here and everything we've done to basically sum up how well you think Britain prepared for war. So in your book or on your piece of paper, or you can download this and do it on this if you want to, I want you to make notes on each of these so you've got enough information um, about how well Britain actually prepared for war. Okay, and once you've done that, we are completed. Okay, thank you very much.